This podcast is Entel Enhanced. To see pictures, articles and links of what's being discussed, download the Entel app. Hello, welcome to the Big Scuba Show. I'm Miranda Kristovnikov and I'm on the Big Scuba podcast with Gemma and Ian. And I learnt scuba dive when I was at Bristol University uh, in the chilly waters of the UK. And from that moment onwards, I just fell in love with the idea of just being underwater, being able to breathe underwater and being part of this amazing marine environment that so few of us actually get to be involved with. And I'm very passionate about diving in the UK. I absolutely love it. And I'm a mother of two. Both my kids dive now and I, you know, I couldn't be happier now. We've got a family of divers. Hello, everyone. My name is Dave. I'm a scuba diver in Pembrokeshire in West Wales. And for me, the main reason I go diving is I think that it's great to see like the sort of like national geographical programs on the telly, but how much better is it to actually enjoy that experience yourself underwater, you know? And I think for me, that's one of the big reasons for me for diving is to enjoy all the wildlife. Welcome back to the Big Scooper podcast. We are your hosts, Gemma and Ian. Before we get cracking with today's episode, we just want to make sure you have hit that follow button or the subscribe button, depending on what platform you are listening on. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you enjoy what you're going to hear today, we would really appreciate it if you can leave a review and a five-star rating. So now that's out of the way, we just want to say welcome and thank you for all tuning in. And now it's time to dive into today's episode. Hello everyone, welcome back to a big scoop podcast coming at you loud and clear. My name is Ian, I'm one of the co-hosts and with me is... My name is Gemma and I'm the other co-host. Yes, we're sitting around the mic, going to be having a chat about diving and telling you about who's coming up. So, uh, do we need to tell you who's, what this podcast is all about? Yes, Come on, you we know do. all about this. No. They know all what we're this a... website, what, <laughs> no. what this podcast is about. We're called The Big Scooper Podcast and we talk about diving and all things related to the underwater world and on the water as well. We do. And we talk to people who've done all sorts of things and like Miranda Krasovnikov. You need to see help with that. <laughs> and David Kennard. And Dave Kennard. <laughs> There are guests coming up today. Yes, who uh, are doing some really exciting stuff. You'll be pleased to hear. Exactly, yes. So Just you... the type of people that we like to talk to. So Miranda, <laughs> uh, you, you probably might have seen on the BBC uh, One show. Uh, she's a presenter, author, diver, mum. Journalist, uh, I suppose, journalist, presenter. Uh, yeah. and, know, and she talks about natural history a lot doesn't she a lot about wildlife yeah. and she's a big um supporter of the uk diving uh circuit paddy ambassador she is yeah yeah so uh, oh three ambassador i believe yeah with a purple oh three suit yeah really groovy suits yeah and then she linked up and she's a patron for narc neptune's army of rubbish cleaners based in pembrokeshire and yes. that's our other guest which is dave kennard and we speak to them both both passionate about diving. Uh, Dave is particularly passionate about getting that rubbish out of the water. Yeah, and when we say rubbish, we don't necessarily mean specifically bits no, of old... Nets, yeah, nets, nets, lost lobster pots, which yeah. was really interesting because they're worth... And trash, you know, stuff that gets washed in. And, yeah, could be you know, contained. If that shouldn't be there, particularly as man-made, it shouldn't be there, then, you know, he'll go down and... and with his uh, you know, friends in part his of the army. club, his army, his <laughs> army of cleaners will go down there, and uh, they'll make a plan. If they can't, if they need to, with lifting bags, uh, they'll go get down there and lift yeah, them up. Yeah, yeah, and it also depends if it's become a natural habitat, then they'll leave it. Yeah, and some of this conversation that we've got with uh, Miranda and Dave is about how you can set up your own project. Mm. like Dave did in 2005, um, and how you can go about and do it. Because it's important, you know, we can't always travel here, there and everywhere. So for a lot of us, we've got to focus on what's in our backyard. And that's where it all starts, really. Yeah. So, yeah, and that comes up in the conversation, doesn't it? Yeah, so, it does. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so, so that's coming up. That is coming up. Um, we'll talk about a bit what we've been up to as well, but... Let's just talk about, remind our lovely friends and listeners about, we love happy bottles. We do. 
so happy bottles happybottles.com um, they are a drinks bottle that keep your drink lovely and hot and also cold kids and going back to school soon perfect opportunity to have a look at happybottles.com and get 20 percent off uh, lovely bright colors they have handles they have lockable lids well made you've dropped them in the sea I've took one to the stain garth and it survived. Yeah, I've dropped it off my bike and they're still getting strong. And you're going to get 20% off. What's the worry? Yeah, so, and it is really good because they're right, really brightly coloured. So it's a good way to try and keep your children hydrated. Just use that promo code. Big Scuba. There we go. Um, H-A-P-I bottles. Dot com. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and we also, we've got new friends of the podcast. Yep, we've linked up with a company called Waterhall, and they're based down in Cornwall. Pray tell, who are they? They produce sunglasses, but also litter picking equipment, so hoops to hold your rubbish bags and actual litter pickers. And they make all of the plastic elements out of recycled plastic from ghost nets, so obviously discarded fishing gear. Yeah. Yeah, so they, uh, if you're looking around, and you, which links in really well, we, you know, we don't That's just throw <laughs> these things together. That's good, isn't it? I know, we, you know, people might think that we kind of just, what's the word? Throw it up and hope it falls down in right No, place. not at all. We, we actually plan and program these things. And uh, like a... Um, a well-oiled machine. Awesome. Uh, so if you are interested in water halls, they make some fab sunglasses and also some, you know, these litter picking, mm-hmm. uh, lip pickers and hoops and things like that, all made out of plastic, uh, recycled plastic. Um, go to waterhall.co. Yep. So it is literally .co, nothing yeah. on the end. And uh, get and put in big scuba. When you get to your basket. And, and you'll get 10%. Yeah. So it's, it's oh, worth doing. Saving your money. <laughs> saving your money. And you look really cool in these amazing sunglasses. Yeah. So there we go. Uh, that's that. Um, also, I noticed this week that um, our other friends of the podcast, Fourth Element, mm-hmm. got a sale on. They have, yeah. So head over to their website and uh, you can pick up, I think they've got the Hydra dry seats on offer at the moment. So. Yeah, which, you, you know, you dive in. You're, yeah. You know, you're a big Lovely, fan of them. comfy suit, yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, not bad. Is it? Uh, good. Nice to have a sale on to get to that time of year. And also, O3, they emailed us this week to say uh, their semi-dry suits, which I've wore a few times and mm-hmm. might wear at Farns, uh, don't know, um, are back in stock and their zippers boots. Yes, and we're... And they um, asked us if we could let you lovely people know. Yeah, so and we've got the zipperless boots and they're very comfortable. So we've done that. I, yeah. I do like the... Um, I'm not just saying that, um, but the... I do like the uh, semi-dry suit. I think uh, I like the freedom it gives. Yeah. I like my dry suit, you know, but I do like summertime being in my semi-dry. Um, and the only reason why I didn't dive in my semi-dry last time in the farms... That was at the end was, of July, it was wasn't it? Top, top temperature was 12 degrees, mm-hmm. and it weren't particularly warm when we got out either. Not above the water either, no. So oh, I thought, mm, a you whole made day the... on the boat, nearly a whole day on the boat. I don't know if I want it. But I'm taking it again this time. So I might, I'll see, I'll see how it goes. Yeah, take it and see. Yeah, so yeah. we'll see, we'll see. Funny enough. Um, we'll just have to see how that pans out. We'll be reporting back. Uh, have you had any Coast Guard in this week? Not this week. I've been on call, but every time I seem to go off call, things happen. So uh, the week before, uh, I was just on one shout. Um, Some youngsters had got into a bit of difficulty under one of the groins. Um, The sea had got a bit rough, but they were... The youngsters had problems with their groins? No, they'd got got in the, you know, woodwork on the beach. And uh, obviously playing, having fun, but yeah, got into a bit of uh, difficulty. So the lifeguards were first on scene and then the coast guards turned up. So, but yeah, Mm. I think they were all okay so no, that's good. but yeah there's it has been well looked quite busy with um lots it's of the city season on the beaches at the moment with the well tourists. they are customers uh, that's what we call them remember yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. very true <laughs> yeah but anyway but yeah try and be safe out on the water and if you see anybody in some difficulty dial 999 and ask for the coast guard and someone like Jem will pop out and see how you're doing. 
<laughs> yes, but main thing is be safe. So think about going into the sea and not using inflatables. Uh, and no. Well, or you can use inflatables. If they're tethered. If you've got a piece of rope and you're yeah. holding to it. I used yeah. to do the same with my pair, my kids, and um, I used to, or a kayak or something. Yeah. And I would have a long piece of rope and I'd be on the beach and they'd be in the kayak. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, how are you going to get it back? Safety comes first. And you never know when the weather is going to take a little turn. It's, uh, the, no. the wind can change direction. The yeah. tide can turn. So, but And yeah. they had life jackets as well. Mm. But the main well. thing is have fun on the water, but be safe and plan. Yeah, that's very good. That's good. Uh, what have I been doing? Um, you mean busy well, with work? And CrossFit. I had to, mm. uh, after having a couple of days off, um, with one thing or another, I had to uh, catch up on work. Yes, yeah. So, but uh, we all have to work for a living. Yeah, <laughs> certainly do. I've just destroyed the to my bed. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and then yesterday, we went back to Blakeney, uh, one of our we favourite haunts to a kayak. We had fab day yesterday. Yep, so the weather forecast was good. Nobody was on the water. No, we got there and it was like 11 o'clock and we're thinking, where is everybody on a bank holiday weekend? Yeah, that was yeah. F- absolutely fantastic. On the uh, north, on the North Norfolk coast, uh, on the east part of the UK, uh, if you look on the map, there's a little bit that sticks out and it says Blakeney Point. Yeah, and we went from Morstan Quay, so we took two kayaks, uh, we had our we wore our wet, shorty wetsuits and we had our life jackets on. Yeah. And then we launched. We'd taken into account all the tides um, and we cracked it. Yeah, Spot go on. out with the uh, outgoing tide, make camp, you know, um, you know, do some, we did some podcast stuff and some... Uh, had a, yeah, swim in the sea. Social media stuff, go for a swim. And uh, weather, yeah, it was sunny in the end. And then when the tide came back in, we yeah, normally stay out there where the wreck is. There's a wreck out there which yeah. is partly uncovered, isn't it? It was in lovely. It was just like lovely. It's just all sandy. Um, did a bit of metal detecting, didn't we? And yeah, you didn't find anything apart from a big ship. Yeah, big, <laughs> this is this big, big wreck, wreck. The ship <laughs> that kept buzzing yeah. a few times. And then we came back in on the incoming tide, and we saw all the seals. Loads. There yeah, were loads. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and it was. We went two weeks ago. No and jet skis. Yeah, two weeks ago there were lots of jet skis, which was quite a bit of a shock because we'd never seen that before. And no. then this time it was beautifully quiet. There were a couple of sailing boats. Yesterday and... was the Blakeney uh, that I know and yeah. love. Seals yes. were in the water. They kept popping their heads up and sort of blowing, going... Yeah, us, coming <laughs> under the kayaks and swimming round. Yeah. And having a little nose at what we're doing and... We're just drifting by, weren't we? Just Literally, we by. just sat in the kayaks, no paddling, just drifted yeah. back down the channel and they all popped up around us. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Saw it's some fish. Experience. Saw a shoal of fish yeah. as well, yeah. using the camera underwater and plenty of bird life. It was just, yeah, pretty special yesterday. Yeah, it? yeah, it's a nice place. Yeah, lovely place to visit. Uh, but if you do go, you have got to know... You, the yeah, tides, tides definitely. definitely. Yeah, because one part of the land absolutely just disappears as soon as it's high it tide. That disappears under the sea, so you do yeah. have to know which bit to go on and the current. And it's always a uh, sh- shock at how quickly the sea comes in around us. We sit right in our kayaks, not. and it yeah. just literally fills up around us, and it's just an amazing thing to we experience. We did fourteen kilometers yesterday, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, and that was on a kayak. So, yeah. yeah. So it's a very lovely day. Yeah, uh, we do obviously dive as well. Um, and we mentioned uh, we're back at the farms in a couple of weeks' time with Crystal Sea Yes, Scuba. yep, so looking forward to that. Um, so that'll be back. And we're back on the same boat, I believe, with Ron. Ron, yep, Ron um, the skipper. With with uh, with him. And um, hopefully going to try and get in a dive at Weybourne or which is like our local dive area and mm-hmm. we have you know by the time you get to end of september it's kind of nearly it really partly because um, of the weather but partly get because into of... maybe october but depends on the visibility it does visibility would be sort of i i know some of you dived in november and they were down to like inches yeah of visibility, it's not much fun is it which no not really um 
So it is, it is getting towards the end of our diving window on the coast. But if we can't anyway. do Weybourne, then we've got plans for Maybe Swanage Pier. Swanage, Swanage Pier, yeah. yeah. It'd be nice. So, it's so, a bit yeah. of a drive, but yeah, it's something on the list. It certainly is. Um, okay, well, we've mentioned a few people. We've talked about what we've been up to. Should we get Miranda and Dave on? Yep, so Miranda Krestovnikov and David Kennard. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> Right. Okay, so David, tell us all about Neptune's army of rubbish cleaners. Well, in 2004, I'd been playing rugby locally for a little village side and I got talking to a friend over a pint of beer who worked for Keep Wales Tidy. And he asked me a couple of questions about a a dive club in Pembrokeshire that had done a, 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 a litter pick recently in that area. And I said, oh, well, that's my dive club. And the idea then went from there. And I started then by putting posters up in uh, the local dive centres and using like things that were popular at the time. So, for instance, like things like SpongeBob and things like that. So I was targeting people who, who were into the marine thing. And by saying, you know, that, you know, like some of the stuff from Bikini uh, from SpongeBob, like saying bikini bottom in need of cleaning and things like that, you know. And if you're interested in collecting rubbish off the seabed with a, with a group of divers, then please get contact me. And the whole idea went from there then, and it, it sort of snowballed. And we we're just about coming to the end of our 18th year now. That's amazing. Wow. 18 years. Yeah, yeah. But the problem doesn't get any less though. You know. <laughs> But the problem is, though, is not to get disheartened by it. The, the best thing to do is, is think of what you've done that day as a positive action and yeah. just move on from there because otherwise you'll end up feeling a bit beaten up, burn out, and that's no good to anybody. You know, And I, I think you're better off being the friendly, happy-go-lucky person that doesn't have this big grey cloud following them all the time. And, you know, and I, I think it is important to get the facts out there for sure, but it, 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 in a better way. Yeah. Yeah. So did you, it obviously all started quite local to where you are. Yes. Yes. We, in the first year, I think we did six events. Now mm. we do like seven or eight groups of two so we've gone from doing like six events to doing uh, 18 days of diving a year mm. and that could then I mean the most we did in one day we did 10 or 12 I think we did 10 maybe 12 dive sites in one day gosh because you know I mean some of what we do is, is marine litter on the seabed other things then that we're doing as well are like ghost fishing related so if we know where something is and we, we, we know where that is, then divers get in, get the object out, and then we just move on to another site. Wow. You know, and, and our tidal range in Pembrokeshire is very large. Yeah. yeah. So it, it does take a bit of planning and a bit of chasing slack water around everywhere. Yeah, that's always a tricky one. <laughs> we, um, yes. yeah, because we, we 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 dived off Lundy uh, a few weeks ago, and we it was quite remarkable the the range of tides there yeah. was, was huge, much bigger than what it is on our side of the UK on the east. Yeah, um, so it's pretty staggering. Yeah, yeah. We 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 have like seven and a half meters or more. Yeah, tidal range yeah. is ridiculous. It's like I I can go to a dive one or two dive sites here. And slack water is just not a thing. It just gets close to stopping. Your boy, your shot line stops, and then it just goes the other way. Mm. Yeah. But that's the challenge of organising the dives we do and the way in which we run the day's events, you know, like I say, which are all about collecting rubbish or foreign foreign objects off the seabed. You know, Mm. the whole idea is to try and, make things as pristine and as best as they can and, and to give nature that little helping hand you know i mean it, it, it's our fault that these things are on the seabed it's got nothing it's not a natural thing 
it's unnatural that these objects are on the seabed. You know, we we found all sorts of things from car we found once to I don't know washing machine drums and parts and microwaves. <laughs> wow. We were doing one cleanup, and I we you know we used like loads of lifting bags and things, and I put on a lifting bag onto a washing machine drum on my side, and then my mate went to put his clip on that side and with that this conga reel swam straight out of the uh, washing machine drum <laughs> no way <laughs> yeah. uh, so what happened to the car the car yeah. we reported that to milford haven port authority who then um passed the details on to uh the, the police and commercial dive team and the car was removed the car uh, the um, last person who had the logbook was a little lady who lived not far away, and she had a phone call then about her car, and <laughs> the people, uh, the the ladies, like response on the phone call. Oh, that was my lovely little car. What 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 what's the issue with my car? And she didn't know. <laughs> no way. So this guy had paid her money for the car, got it assessed. And found out then it was going to cost so much to get anything put right that he never did anything with the logbook and just paid the lady then the cash for the sale and oh then drove God. it off and then he ditched it. You know, but we've had all sorts. I, I think sometimes some of the stranger, we've had some strange wildlife rescues as well, you know. And to me, I think the strangest of all was a grass snake. Yeah, in the water. Wow. Yeah, I see. Um, I don't know how well you know Pembrokeshire, but we were up towards Fishguard, which is by where they get the ferry to go to Ireland. Yeah. Right. And we were on the boat, lovely calm day, which we do have sometimes. Um, the water was flat calm and I could see this thing floating on the water. And I, I thought it was like a, a thin bit of rope, like cold. <coughs> And then all of a sudden, I could see it moving. And I thought, wow. I shouted it to the others on the boat. I said, we've got a sea snake in for it. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. We should so probably we, explain we... to our uh, uh, international listeners as well that we're talking about the southwest part of Wales, right on the westerly part of uh, the UK. Um, a while ago, um, I found a Chris Packer. It was about 18 years old. You know, do you, are you finding litter which has been in the water for a long period of time? Is any of it dated or is it all, can you tell with anything? Sometimes things are very hard to date. I mean, uh, you know, with, with regards to things like that, it, it is hard to prove dates um, or even the origin or as to where or to have an idea of who or why yeah. somebody might have put that in the water. I mean, we, you know, we do do fly tipping sites as well as, you know, like ang we do ang uh, angling cleanups. I mean, one day alone, we, we removed 730 fishing weights off one site. Wow. Done by four buddy teams of divers in one day. That's a lot of lead. Well, it's not lead anymore, is it? But it's, um, it's well, a lot you know, of we, stuff. we do make it into, um, dive weights which are then given back to the volunteers if they want any dive weights yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's a good idea yeah you know i mean yeah there's 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 a lot of scope for us to do many things you know and and i i think it's the same for lots of places within the uk that you know we there could be groups out there of a higher number than there is now replicating the sort of work we do yeah 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 you know and, and it's the same with other sports i mean i suppose if you look at like surface against sewage is probably comparable to us but their their membership and the amount of people who surf is far greater than ours so but not every surfer is going to do a beach clean mm. and likewise not every diver is going to want to give up the the um leisure time to go and collect litter 
But, yeah. you know, for me, I, I find that that's the sort of dive that I'm doing these days. And if I'm not doing like a litter dive or something like that, then I'm probably doing a recce dive to see if that is like uh, a litter issue in that area. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which is quite, you know, it was quite interesting. I mean, you know, when you're collecting little, collecting like angling line and things like that, you're so well focused and your eyes are just concentrating in on the rocks that, you know, you get to see all the amazing wildlife we have. Mm. You know, if you love needy branks, and I, I would suggest to anybody, if they want to go and see needy branks, is to come out with us and we can go to certain angling sites that we go to and you'll see loads. You know, or, or butterfish or pipe fish, all these like quirkier type of fish that are well worth seeing. You know, when you when you're more relaxed and in the water. I mean, there's so many things that are in the water that people are just swimming by. It's easy without... to miss them, yeah. Yeah, of course. You know, you look at like anglerfish or something like that. I'm sure we've all swam past like, you know, them on occasion, and you wouldn't know. Mm. you know they're so well camouflaged yeah yeah (laughs) no it's amazing Mm. yeah Yeah. diving in the uk is brilliant yeah exactly there is so much to be said for it so so miranda how did you get involved in the neptune army yeah well i need to second about diving in the the uk (laughs) because it is and and about the little things being overlooked i was diving with dave a couple of weeks ago and we brought up a lobster pot and spent hours and hours looking at all the tiny things that have been on this lobster pot it's probably been down a couple of years and they were all wow. sorts of little sea squirts and uh, tiny tiny crabs and everything it was, it was a whole ecosystem on this and you'd never normally sit and look at that so it is fascinating yeah. anyway how did i get into learn to dive so I, um, or get to learn, get to meet Dave, did you ask? Sorry. Yeah, how did you get involved? Um, yeah, so Dave I was Dave. working, so I um, present um, a natural history pieces on BBC's The One Show. And um, so I, it's about 10 years ago where we did a piece with Nock and Dave. And so um, I went and, and had a clean up dive with Dave and I'd never done anything like that before. Um, I had no idea that there were people who literally dedicate most of their diving hours underwater to cleaning up other people's mess. And it really struck me uh, meeting Dave and all the other people in his group as well, just how dedicated these people are. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable the lengths they go to, the time they spend, um, all completely voluntary. Um, and so we've remained in contact ever since. Um, and that's how I've sort of, you know, just become a, a real supporter of the work that he does. Um, so much so that, say, a couple of weeks ago, um, I took my son Ollie uh, to dive with Dave because so Ollie only learned to dive last year. Mm. Uh, you know, obviously want to, I want him to experience the wealth and the beauty of diving in all its wondrousness. But I also want to teach him um, the, the sort of the darker side of, of what's going on in the marine environment. He you know is is showing an interest in conservation maybe marine conservation so I wanted to give him an insight into uh what else goes on under the water and I think this is the big problem which is the it's the big message I think that Dave's trying to tell everybody is that you know so many of us stand on a beach and we look out at sea and there's this wonderful blue water there Mm. oh isn't that nice it's the sea isn't it lovely it looks quite clean I can't see any rubbish we have no idea what's going on beneath the surface just because there aren't plastic bags floating on the surface doesn't mean that you know there's nothing underneath and so much of the stuff that's thrown into the sea sinks down and it's there for such a long period of time and so working with Dave really opened my eyes um you know things like monofilament fishing line you know people just sort of fishing off the the coastline and you know your lead weights get caught and you you know your line snaps but that line meters and meters and meters of it gets wrapped around spider crabs and dead men's fingers and things like that um mm. or worse um so it's not just you know seeing seals with bits of fishing line around their necks it's a lot of the smaller creatures that we don't yeah. really appreciate and they don't really get the, the press time as well right. um so uh so we the dive that i the diving that i did with dave was all about retrieving lost lobster pots so fishermen don't want to lose their lobster pots they're worth quite a lot of money about 85 pounds per lobster pot so nobody wants to lose that but if they're you know setting a whole line a whole string of these things and you know there's a big storm or the big tides that dave was talking about as mm-hmm. well 
Um, inevitably, over time, one, two, maybe ten might get lost. So Dave and his team locate these and go down and dive them, work out which conditions you know are going to be appropriate for lifting them. And Ollie and I went down and did a, a, a number of these over the course of a couple of days. Right. It was really eye-opening for, for Ollie just to realise how much stuff is down there. And then you bring it up and what's inside the lobster pot? Well, there's some lobster and quite a lot of crabs and then a whole load of other things living on there. And, um, you know, all the small stuff's fine, but the lobster and the crabs that have found their way in definitely can't find their way out. So that looks yeah. like fishing over time and nobody's retrieving what's inside. Mm. And that's where it's just tragic because those animals are trapped forever inside that unless somebody like Dave comes to the rescue. Um, so it was quite an uplifting thing to do. Uh, it was quite sad, but also really it was a there was a really positive thing that we were investing time to clearing up the mess that some people have made of our oceans but we were you know we were liberating <laughs> sea creatures and giving them a chance to sort of fight for another day so it was it was it was lovely um and 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 really good fun and actually it's something that a lot of people can get involved with you don't even need to be a diver really to get involved in in organizations like this mm. lots of organizations around the country doing beach cleans and um, you can support a group like Dave's without actually being able to dive because actually, quite frankly, it costs a lot of money to do yeah. what Dave does. You know, they've got to hire a boat. Um, mm -hmm. They have to pay for that boat and the fuel. And a lot of people are taking time off work and traveling a very, very long way to go and do these dives. So um, actually, they need a lot of support and they need a lot of uh, screen time, airtime, publicity uh, to tell people what they're doing because the work they do is thankless and amazing yeah, yeah. it's it's tragic uh, when you um said about seeing the wildlife caught in these crab pots and that um I, I i did a dive in brighton a couple two or three years ago and on one of the wrecks i can't remember the, the wreck now uh that's named but there was a whole load of fishing line that got trapped over it and we're just um tourists um did, did one dive on there but there was a whole load of lobsters and crab beautiful lobsters and crabs all caught up in it and it was all tangled up all around this wreck um and it w was pretty sad to see because you know they're going to be stuck we tried cutting some of them free um and we just basically it was quite deep and we soon ran out of air you know we'd go back up um and we just weren't catered for that but it's um yeah it, it's not good to see it's a massive problem and i just don't think it's one that gets enough airtime. no uh, i know there are a lot of other issues that you know we're talking about globally but um i just don't think enough people put their heads underwater and realize what's going on and how awful it is and the scale of the problem yeah. so we need to be talking about it more i mean there are things that can be done you know there are lots of diving operations that are doing that there are companies that are making stuff out of this ghost there net. Is. you can buy swimwear and t-shirts and stuff made out of ghost net which is fantastic um, but we just need to be talking about it a lot more. And for those I've, who don't survive, we just need to make them aware and uh, of what the problem is. I, I think when you're saying about things being globally, I think we need to concentrate on our own doorstep for yeah. mm. looking at other people's backyards. You know, I mean, we're, we're very fortunate here, say, in Pembrokeshire. We've got the northernmost uh, colony of, say, pink sea fans. Now, I can think of one dive in particular that I did with another colleague from NARC, and we spent somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes cutting all the angling line off this coral. Wow. And this coral, it takes so many years just for it to grow, like, one inch. That I, You know, I'm, I'd like to think that the people who, um, like anglers, etc., would have an understanding of it but obviously for them because they can't see things they don't know what what happens to their equipment you know yeah, yeah they're so, just pulling and, stuff and, out aren't they, they... And, and the problem is with um marine litter and any form of litter is as soon as there's one lot another lot collects or, or it attracts it seems to attract more so it'll become bigger <laughs> and I, I think this is the same, say, with if you were walking down a country lane and people have, like, left a sofa. You could go along there a bit later during the week and might find a chest of drawers and a couple of bags. Yeah. 
You know, I I do not get this mentality. Me and Gemma have talked about this before, you know, and why do, why is it, I'm going to rant, why is it people go to a really lovely part of the world, no matter where it is, but it can be just down a nice lane or somewhere like that. And then they discard all their rubbish. Anything? So why do that? When we've got like places where you can go, you know, free council tips and what have you, you can easily... Um, take some, we, you know, one of my sites, uh, somebody has left a sofa and they've actually managed to lift it up a really <laughs> steep bank to le- to uh, dump this sofa, which they could have easily just took it to uh, a council arranged site. Um, I've now got to go collect it. And it's like all the effort involved, but actually it would have been just easier if it had been sorted out earlier and it's that yes. same mentality i never get with people uh discarding stuff off you know in the sea and stuff i, I noticed that out of sight out of mind thing definitely but that mentality do have to change and i think that's probably for the future uh probably one of the biggest battles we'll have is changing that map getting people to care and say and think oh, actually before i just drop that line off the off the end of the boat um actually I'll take that away and we'll do something else with it. You know, is it use it, getting p- people to actually think well, a little bit more. Well, with, with, their regards, actions. with regards to like angling stuff, we've worked locally with the Pembrokeshire Pebber- Federation of Angling Coaches and we've designed it leaflets and put them out there with, with tips that are being given to us by the angling coaches to put in the leaflet. And we, we've done all the drawing and design layouts, et cetera, to try and educate the anglers so they don't lose so much gear. Yeah. And, and that's the other side of what we're trying to do with NARC is to take part in collaborative um, programs, if you like, to combat these issues. Yeah. So, for instance, when we're doing stuff with, like, uh, ghost fishing or that sort of thing, um, a lot of the time we're doing it from reports from the angling community. So we're sort of like working together. And it's a really good we idea. Did, we did take part in a project um, a good few years back um, about making uh, shellfish sustainably caught or whatever. And, and that was then um, to do with uh, certain parts on a lobster pot. So there'd be like a little escape hatch for undersized fish to crawl out of. And then there would be a um, a ring that holds the clip up, that holds the door up, mm. that this then would deteriorate. And then the, the the clip that they close the pot with would then drop down, the door would drop, the door would drop down, and then the animals from inside could crawl out. But yeah. one of the things that... Um, back with what we're doing isn't it is like a a lot of the fish that we're finding in in lost pots is juvenile Mm. you know or some might even be expecting mothers you know like carrying eggs and and so on so I, I think that the fishermen for themselves which you know for me I'm not really I'm more concerned about the wildlife aspect is that I want to see all these fish in the sea and and I think by trying to do what we're trying to do in the area where we live, hopefully we're, we're making a bit of a difference and yeah. maintaining a healthier fish level than if we weren't doing what we were doing. Yeah. Do you find um, like the fishing boats, if they lose their lobster pots or their baskets, are they contacting you to say they've lost them? Yeah, we, we sort of work with, uh 10 or 12 local fishermen and then we also and one of those then is the contact for uh the local fishing communities so i i will quite often advertise our services which are that miranda said are given voluntarily you know yeah. we're collecting these things to give these these things back to people you know but it's so hard to find rope when it's like 15 mil diameter or 20 mil diameter some of it is weighted so it's on the seabed other stuff is up in the air you know you could be swimming right in that area yeah. and because it's uk diving the downside of it sometimes is poor visibility yeah. so you may not even see 
this rope or this pot, even though you might be two metres or three metres away from it, you know, you wouldn't see it. Yeah. And I think for divers, you know, for me, especially quite new to it, just diving in the UK, you realise there is a lot of seaweed and kelp and you kind of really have to look to try and find things. So if you're really looking for rubbish, that's yeah, it, it does kind of it is very camouflaged. Yes. So, but like Miranda was saying as well, though, um, like with regards to monofilament line, we're talking about something here that like with regards to biodegrading will take 600 years, you know, mm. we're never going to see that. And then when you do look at like plastics that are in the sea and stuff like that, that end up onto the beach, these break down and down in size. They in so little so balls, that, don't they? Yeah, and so much so to a side where size that when you've got like uh, bottom feeding fish, they might even be eating these things. And there's, I, 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 I could quite easily believe that there are fish out there that are swimming around with with bits of plastic inside them. And you know, again, this is also a, the same issue for the seabirds. You know, they might look like as if their stomachs are full or whatever but they're, they're full of foreign products you know yeah. not things that they would normally eat so they're not benefiting by eating those things so they're getting no energy and not being able to keep warm and all of those sort of factors which have a, a huge effect on 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 the um bird wildlife and as we're talking about that now here in Pembrokeshire we have an island called Grassholm, which has the second largest ga gannet colony in the UK. Last week, I saw uh, a report to say that there is an issue there now with avian flu. Mm. Yeah, it was at the Farn Islands as well. They've, yeah. they've, that's been hit bad as well. Yeah, so this is really, really bad. Yeah. You know, I mean, Grassholm, if you were to see it... Um, <laughs> You know, you, you can probably find photos online, I would have thought. Well, I've definitely got some of, yeah. like, ropes and nets and things like that just hanging down from the rocks. Yeah. You know, so and these birds are living in nests that are just, that are lost ropes that they found at sea. I visited Grass Home and you can see that um, there are fledglings trying to fledge from the nest, but they can't because they're all tied up in monofilament and fishing line and yeah. stuff like that. So it is yeah. quite interesting. But can I can I sort of push in a positive message here? I think um, people care about stuff they've experienced. And uh, so, you know, if you go for a walk in your local woodland and you see litter or your local park and you see litter, you you see it. So you, mm. you can do something about it. You're upset by it. You can go and call the local council. You can go and do something about it. If we get more people diving, I know we can't get everybody diving, but if we encourage, you know, more people to learn to dive and be aware of what's going on in the marine environment, then we've got more eyes on what's yeah. going on. Yeah. We've got more people who are passionate and more people who will be like Dave and do something about it. Yeah. And that's why I think it's actually really, really important to tell everybody about how amazing our marine environment is. We do have some beautiful, beautiful dives around the UK. Some of the best wildlife experiences I've ever had have been in around the UK. You know, we've got wonderful marine protected areas and conservation zones. You know, we've got Lundy that you were talking about, Ian. I mean, I was diving in Lundy with my son with the grey seals earlier in the year absolutely amazing, amazing. Yeah. seahorses down in studland we've got seals up in the farn islands we've, you know we've got so much here we need to encourage people to stick their heads oh. underwater yeah. and experience it for themselves or even snorkeling. and they can see what we're talking about and yeah. Oh, snorkeling. Yeah. absolutely there are snorkeling trails ridge bay's got a snorkeling trail they become quite a po popular thing now so you don't even need to learn yeah. to scuba dive do you no, people yeah and I we've got a chalk reef up in Sheringham and that's become that's really trendy to, isn't it yeah, yeah. I've done that it's lovely yeah, yeah. well it's their Tuesday night and that was the first time that I've snorkeled in the sea basically and to see like crabs on the you know floor and you're seeing all this wildlife and you've got no tank on you've got just a mask and snorkel and it's accessible to everyone yeah. absolutely. I, I think another good thing with diving is Diving is a hobby, interest, sport, whatever you'd like to call it, that can be done day or night. 
you know, and some of the experiences I've had on night dive have been fantastic. Mm. We've, you know, we've had like uh, bioluminescence and all these sort of things, you know, which are just brilliant. Yeah. So with your yeah. with your organisation, how are you recruiting people to get in the water and to help you? Well, ob- obviously, we're always after new volunteers. I mean, if you don't maintain that, then you have no future. It's the same with the dive club. If you don't stay, I, do, I, I generally believe if you don't stay instructing as a dive club, that is like signing the death warrant of the dive club because people need to learn how to dive to make your numbers up yeah. because people just drop out of things. You know, it's like I would say at the moment, you know, narc active diving divers this year, we probably had, I don't know, 26, 28 divers um, that I sort of like try and um, put into a diary and, and so on and share the dives out. So I, 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 you know, so that's like 26, but then, there's, I can think of another 10 or more that didn't actually get to go diving with us this year, you know, and, you know, I, I we, we do attract certain volunteers, we mm. do, and, and we're happy for that, and I would always like that to be the case, and I'd always like to, if, if people um, carry on doing it when they do their own dive. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They don't have to come out with a group to do something. You know, if you're diving, I'd like to think that if you saw like a, a, a can or a bottle on the seabed, I'd like to think that people would automatically think to pick it up. Yeah, yeah. A, a bag, you know, or a net bag should be a piece of like standard kit that you yeah, have on, on you. I, yeah, I, and like a little um, what's it called? A little line cutter or, or um, a good quality knife. Yeah. You know, this should be standard kit. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at our playground here. And I don't know about you, I'd rather have our playground as, you know, as nature intended. Mm. You know, I wouldn't want to walk around a park and see, you know, lots of litter strewn all around the place. It's like, you know, there's, there's ways and means, I think, of, of doing things as well. It's like if you look like a like a national park or, or something like that, and let's say it's to go and walk up a mountain or something like that, then to me it would seem wrong to have a shop there at the bottom selling bottles of water when they should be like saying to people, there's a tap there, you can fill your bottle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really got to start no. with. Yeah, we can hear you, David. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. We're here. <laughs> oh, you're back. Yeah. No, we're Sorry. Gonna hear you. Did um, you hear all of that or not? Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 We did. All right. Um. So, Miranda, you said that your son obviously has recently started diving. So, how obviously is he thirteen? So, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, has he got? What do his friends think? Has he got friends that are interested in diving, or is he quite unique? In his- yeah, it's quite unusual, actually. Um, I think he's got one other friend who's who's done a you know a, a junior open water paddy course, but he is uh, he just took to it. You know, it's one of those things. It's like so. My daughter learned to dive when she was eleven. Um, she sort of did her her basic open water, but it didn't go any further than that. But with Ollie, it's like oh, I love that. That was fantastic. When's the next thing? When are we going? You know, and we went to Grenada together earlier in the year as well, and that was amazing. We were doing some conservation work out there, which again was just totally eye opening. And for me as a mom as well, it's just a wonderful thing to show him all these lovely things and places and habitats and and share some of my favorite diving experiences with him um and hopefully you know see that he moves in that direction uh, as he's older and he's already started doing um uh you know sort of telling people at school about it had to do a presentation because he got time off school to go to Grenada oh, wow. <laughs> to and do a, a presentation and I think that went down really well and you know I just hope that he inspires people around him in his own yeah. gender, really, 
way he's, he's not one to sort of shout about what he does but um hopefully very quietly um he he's will... got a very posh 03 dry suit as well that's mine <laughs> <laughs> i've got two identical purple dry suits I oh, okay. when i'm filming there has been we have been on filming trips where not me but other people their dry suits have either the seal's gone or they've got great colors nightmare if you're <laughs> i know so very, very lucky. Thank you, Row 3 wonderful people. Um, I've got two identical ones. Luckily, because obviously Ollie's 13, so he's growing, so I can't get him a dry suit right now. Yeah. But he tried mine on, and apart from it being slightly big around the waist, <laughs> it fits him because he's the same height as me, but only for this year, because his feet are already about two sizes bigger than mine, and next year he'll be about a foot. <laughs> <laughs> Be a grace, but so for this year only, we are sort of his and hers like purple dry suits. Yeah, brilliant. I hope he likes purple. <laughs> I don't, you know, I just, he's just happy to be in the water. Doesn't yeah, that's all the matters. But you don't just, look at yourself underwater, do you? <laughs> yeah, with, with us as well, though. I mean, like I hinted at earlier, you know, like educational materials is that we also give talks, so it could be a school, it could be, um you know, adult things, whatever, over 60s, WI, whatever, you know. But for me, one of the most enjoyable uh, events we did was with a local school here, and I went and gave a talk, and then I said to the teacher, I said, how about if um, the children can come along to, like, one of the fly-tipping sites, and they can see what what we do mm. and they were all from like the local special needs school so we'd involved them and then they came along and they um did the dive marshalling for us for the day oh, wow. so they asked all the divers who they were what size bottle they had and did the air taste good and how much air they had and so on you know so to me i i thought that was just a, a great little event that we got involved in that is, that is good. And I think, um, you know, the litter pick and, and all that is one part, but that's all part of the bigger picture, which includes community involvement and yes. education and uh, making people awareness, you know. And I think uh, it's brilliant. It's the things that you're telling us, uh, you know, that's just I, I all great you know, stuff. Grass, grassroots stuff, isn't it? You know, and, yeah. and we're, we're trying really hard to mix in with all the different sort of communities within our area so if ever they're out and about and they notice things then hopefully they would then relay the information back to us so then we would have an idea and then i'd be able to plan to dive those areas or to find those things and so forth i mean facebook in a way and things like that is quite good for us i mean i i put things on like bees at wales you know to advertise that we're diving and if anybody has seen anything could they yeah. let me know mm. oh, and, and that works from time to time but the biggest one for that is, is like working with the fishermen because obviously like Miranda said they don't want to lose their equipment you know if you're looking at a string of 10 pots you know you, you're looking at 10 you know 100 that's thousand it's like 1200 1300 pounds to them wow. yeah. their livelihood and isn't it? yeah yeah, and, and some of the stuff, when they lose it, they lose a lot more than that. Mm. And so we we go out and uh, about a month ago, we lifted 14 lost pots for one fisherman. Wow. Wow, that's quite so, a lot. You know, yeah, it was, a, it was a hard dive too. It was in like seven, eight metres. So it was just kelp everywhere and gullies and, and these pots are just, they just seem to be able to find their way somehow into the, the worst cracks going you know it's a real wrestling match i mean i think for anyone really who comes out with narc they don't want the best suits going they want something that's hard wearing so how do you how do you check um when somebody comes along and they they say they're a diver um you know do you do you look for certain criteria you know of yeah. what you're asking for from a diver if it was like a BZAC diver, I'd want like a sport diver. Okay. And then above, obviously. And with Paddy, uh, it would be rescue diver because yeah. obviously 
training structure is different, and the SAA have an equivalent then of uh, the BZAC sport diver, and then obviously all the other different agencies have that as well. But, yeah. but for me, one of the most important things, you know, it, it is how much experience they have in the water. Mm. You yeah. know, and, and other things like what other skill sets can they offer the group? That have we got people here who've got first aid tickets and, and things like that, you know, and those are important then as well. Yeah. 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 You know? yeah. Um cake making skills are quite important too. <laughs> <laughs> Must be able to make a cup of tea as well. Tea, coffee. <laughs> yeah. Dave's cake making skills are quite good though, aren't they, Dave? So that's that is quite key. Yeah. We have uh, <laughs> a bit of carrot cake, something like that. Is <laughs> this I, I think one of the things is like I try and make it the conservation sort of work that we do is fun. But it's fun and it's safe yeah. and it's all of those things. And also the sort of work we do uh, and so on is is something that is open to recreational divers. You know, I, 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 I do like people to have like a search and recovery qualification because I think yeah. that's important that people know how to use a lifting bag. Yeah. But also yeah. there's other skill sets. I mean, we with through generosity of our funders recently, you know, we had purchased some, am I allowed to say, um, like an underwater camera thing that is like GP, yeah. if you know, GP10, without saying their name. No, is go that, for it. Okay. That's not yeah, we're not. We're fine. Yeah. Right, so <laughs> we've got some, we've just recently been, uh, we've recently purchased um, four GoPro 10s. And, you know, I think that's important then to help us to develop and get our messages out there. It's like, you know, this is what we're doing this is how bad things are yeah well it's getting that visual above water isn't it to... yeah yes because obviously it's, you know like we say outside out of mind even if they know there's an issue they don't know where these issues are yeah yeah you know and and you know you know we're, we're unhooking fish all sorts corals and tangling crustacean you know there's a there's a lot we do and and yeah, I, I, I really enjoy the diving we do, you know, and if I don't, I think even though I've been doing it for 18 years, I think if I didn't enjoy it, I would have packed it in. Yeah. I think you would have done by now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a, I enjoy it. And B, it, it seems like a positive thing to do on the day, you know? Yeah. And like yeah. I don't like this whole um, bad attitude that people can, you know, uh, give off you know it's like i think that you know there's no point in being negative right you know if we're finding stuff that's great and if we don't find stuff that's brilliant too mm. yeah yeah you know, that means then no oh, right okay so that area is clean that's great news yeah 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 and shouting about you know your your successes as well it's, uh, it's... yeah it's it, and it's as important to know where things are and not mm. you know because you know, we're we are a funded group, you know, various people give us uh funding or organizations and people's workplace we get funding from. Some of our volunteers have like work days, so we get a bit of funding through that. You know, the, the, we we're very fortunate in a way, you know, we do get quite a bit of funding, you know, but there's never enough, is there, really? Because there's always more you could do with having more. Yeah. But that's the problem, isn't it? The more you have, the more you want to do things. And, and <laughs> yeah. 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 No, that's so. If people want to find out more about the Neptune army of uh, rubbish cleaners, where is the best place for them to go to find out a bit more about what you do? Well, we're in a transitional thing at the moment with our website. So we're, Again, you know, one of the important tools for us to get our messages out there is, is like social media and websites and so forth. So um, there's a new one to come out, but the one we've got at the moment, I think if people were to look up 
narc diving, they would come come onto our page. Mm-hmm. So if they went onto Facebook, you'd just find us under Neptune's Army of Rubbish Cleaners. I tell you what, there's sometimes when you do a search online and you type in certain acronyms, it's surprising what you can come across. Like I think I went looking for NARC once and I think I came across some North Atlanta Rage Club or something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I quickly realised that wasn't us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but but, that's well, if, <laughs> if people put in Neptune Army, that might help. <laughs> we'll put a link in the uh, show notes anyway, won't we, for the <laughs> website? <laughs> yeah. So, that's you're. Information. And I think this is important. Yeah. So, you know? Have you, Miranda, have you got any future plans for any more outings with uh, David coming up? Yeah, I know the moment, the moment I left Pembrokeshire, I had Dave on the phone again going, oh, can we do it all again? Or what about this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's great. laughs> so actually, yeah, it was really good crack on the boat as well. It was really, you know, had a really good laugh. I think that's what made the trip as well, because the diving might not have been the best diving I've ever done. It's diving with a purpose, certainly. Um, yeah. but you're not diving to see necessarily beautiful uh Pembrokeshire scenery um but actually the the team that we were with and the boat skipper and everything were brilliant and and so that you know that was all part of the the trip so yeah. um Ollie's really keen to go back and do some more so I think we'll probably hopefully we'll be back before um the end of the summer I don't know life's cool. busy at the moment but uh, school ho- school gets in the way of all these things it it does. Does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. school um so uh yeah hopefully we'll be back and if not we'll be we'll be back again next year to do some more with dave have you made it to south ireland yet because for our some of our listeners who may have just joined us um because probably won't realize maybe that this is not your first time with us you was actually two years ago um in july 2020 a whole different world then we were in middle of lockdowns and things like that and uh, you were, you were saying to us that you had a, a holiday booked and that was going to be cancelled <laughs> to go. Everything and was cancelled. You were hoping by the time we um, speak to you again, uh, you would have made it to South Ireland for yeah, diving. We, we went to Alderney instead, which is one of my favourite places in the universe. And so we went camping on Alderney, which is one of the oh, wow. Channel Islands. Because people go, Alderney? Never heard of that. What, what is it? Where is it? Uh, so we did. We went there. And actually Where spent a lot of time in the sea. It was amazing. Uh, didn't do any diving there, which is a real shame. But um, I can highly recommend it as a place. Mm. It's a world away from... Whereabouts is it in the UK? That's at one of the Channel Islands. It's the most northerly Channel Island. Okay. Um, it's only got a population of about 1,500 people. It's a tiny little island, but the bays are beautiful. And we stayed on the campsite there and swam every morning in a bay. And it was just me and Ollie in the water and wow. uh, nobody else. And also the water was just crystal clear, beautiful uh, wow. beaches and oh, just such an incredible place to go. So it was that was really, it's, it takes a little bit of an effort to get there. Um, but it was, it was well worth it. So, um, yeah, really beautiful. And I just, I don't mind where I go as long as there's water involved. So we will be going down to Pembrokeshire on holiday. Sorry, Dave. (laughs) Uh, in about two weeks time, uh, to another favorite spot down there near Little Haven. Um, see Dave, whether we get any diving in, I'm not sure. Um, but we went there last year and went paddleboarding the sea and it was like the Caribbean and it's beautiful. So we have so much it's, here it's in the like UK. So the just as lockdown is finished, you don't have to get on a plane and go. No, really? <laughs> just stay. With the weather we've got at the moment as well. It's stunning. Yeah. Stay yeah. here. Yeah. And we can both say, you know, we've dived in the UK solidly for like two years. We haven't been abroad and it's just amazing because yeah. there's, there's so much on our bucket list around the UK to keep ticking off. Swanish Pier. To... Yep, that's another one now. Yeah, I've been yeah. looking at that actually. Only only yesterday I was looking at trips down to Swanage. So I'm hoping to do that um, yeah. a few weekends time. So. Yeah. And that's what? lovely. Swanage Pier. Uh, what did I film? That I filmed Corkwing Rass 
uh, so a bit earlier on the year uh, for the one show. Amazing oh. that, a, you know, a fish builds a nest out of seaweed. And somebody, oh, wow. if you go so the, the male wrasse, they build a, a seaweed nest and the, the best and showiest nest impress the best females, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and somebody said that um, you can actually get bits of seaweed. And if you go to a male who's, who's doing his nest building, you can actually offer him a little bit of seaweed. And no way. Take it from you. And I tried this with a fish. So I thought, oh, well, you know, I was sort of looking at the side and shape of the seaweed that he was selecting so I tried to do the same and sort of dangled it in front of him and he sort of he picked it out of my hands and this was like he took a look at it it was like (laughs) (laughs) seaweed nest building Uh, uh, it's it's a lovely comical moment with me and a fish underwater i mean honestly you sort of think that the animals that you're going to interact with underwater are going to be dolphins and seals and that sort of thing but actually cork wing rats really great (laughs) oh brilliant yeah yeah no no and it's great you're like ambassador for uk diving because it is yeah just incredible it's yeah. really cool and it's yeah that we have i mean i had a few, couple of dives with dave where the visibility wasn't very good but um it makes the dives that are good even more special because yeah. you don't know what you're gonna you know if you dive in the caribbean yeah every dive's amazing because it's beautiful and warm and clear and all that sort of thing but you know diving in the uk is is more challenging without a doubt but mm-hmm. definitely more rewarding because you really appreciate what you see and when it's good it's really really good yeah you know, when you get to dive with a friendly dolphin or a gray seal or you see a cuttlefish for the first time or you do your first night dive it blows you away completely so it's worth the effort it's worth you know having one or two dives that don't work out very well you just you know go to the pub or have a cup of tea and some of dave's lovely vegan cake and life's okay again isn't it really it's a learning curve yeah Yeah. but go back with it as as like i said as a hobby and a sport or an interest it's like you know it's something we can do at daytime something we can do at night time and for me one of the most fun moments or enjoyable dives i can have would be at st bride's in about three or four meters of water and it's, there's phosphorescence everywhere. And you move your hand quickly around in the water. And it's like you're throwing glitter around and stuff. It's just amazing. Yeah. It's like disco, isn't it? It's amazing. I remember the first time I ever did that. And I just, I couldn't stop moving my hands in the water. I was just sitting no. there just doing Ooh. this the whole time, just moving my hands around. And it was like, you never, it, you never get bored of it. It's like, no. It's just so much fun. So yeah. yeah, how cool is that? And again, lots of people just don't know that that even happens around the UK. You know, no, why? exactly. It's a lot no. more. Miranda, I've got a question for you. Um, oh. And because you, you know we we've gone through the set questions with you before we we'll, and we will steer our listeners to go to those um but i've got a question for you which we didn't ask you before yeah. what gets you out of your comfort zone you know you, you we it's clear that you love your diving um you know so what actually what gets you out of your comfort zone um well, I've, it's interesting now. I've really discovered what that is, and that's diving with Ollie in a situation where I am worried for his safety. So I never, I'm not ever really, never been in a situation massively where I've worried about my own safety. But suddenly, I'm responsible for him in the water. He's really strong. He's really confident. He knows what he's doing. But he's not had the experience and obviously the, the hours in the water that I've had. So I'm sort of second guessing things. So we did, you know, one of the dives we did with Dave was in really, really low visibility. And every time I could literally not see his fins. As a mum, I was like, <gasps> yeah. um, and we had a situation in the Caribbean, actually, where the, the current sort of picked up and I didn't think he was strong enough or experienced enough to deal with that. And I sort of wanted to abort the dive and he was sort of, he was like, oh, well, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. But he didn't know how bad it could get. You know, he didn't know that the current could pick up even more than it was. And then, you know, that sort of snowball effect, that incident pit where things just start getting worse and worse and worse. And then something goes wrong or this equipment failure or something, you know, you mm-hmm. lose yeah. it, whatever. And things really start to go very wrong. And having been in situations like that in the past, I, I just know what can go wrong. So yeah. That's that's now um, what I where I start to feel a little bit <laughs> actually it's just, just the mum in me sort of kicking in. Um, so, but I but I think that's really good. I, I like also like situations where I am challenged. I am out of my comfort zone, and having a couple of experiences like that with Ollie recently, I realised that I should I need to do more of that 
and mm-hmm. you know, as I grow older and more, you know, do you become complacent? I want do you to- build that into like a buddy check when you're doing that? You know, when you before you get in the water with you, but with Ollie, yeah. you know, do you build that in as part of a buddy check? So because we do now. You know, we it's do quite now. important, you know, and I think you've raised a really good point um, because what I, happens I know, if, you know, the current kicks up. What happens if we have that? Something happens to you. Thing, um, you're fine because you don't know that I can't see you behind. You know, we were we were going along a, a, a line, and I was following him, and he was only like two meters in front of me, but I couldn't see him at one point in time. Yeah. So, and he he didn't know that I couldn't see him. No. But it, so it was me really worrying. So, yeah, I think the more and more we talk about these things after the dive, bring them up. And so, so what would happen? And it's that what if scenario. Yeah. Just, and I remember going through this with my daughter when she started to learn to ride and she'd go out on her own and we'd have situations where she'd be riding the horse. You know, what happens if you're in an area, there's no mobile phone signal, you fall off the horse, blah, blah, blah. What do you do? So that's all you can do is, yeah. is just get the kids to think about. In fact, any anybody just yeah. to think about what would you do? So what measures can we put in place to, you know, stop that happening? Or if it does happen, at least you've got all the backup safety gear. You know, this is the procedure as well. You know, if you can't see me, make sure that, you know, you circle for a minute and then you just get up, you know, when I'll meet you at the surface or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. um, it's going through all of those things because it's all very new and exciting at the moment. And he, like I would have been at that age, is, is fearless and invincible. And, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> uh, so it's sort but of it's- sharing my knowledge and experience with him without, you know, wanting to take away his enjoyment and his excitement for the whole thing. Yeah, I think for anyone who's listening, I think it's a point, I think, for particularly for parents when they take children into war, especially when the, the children are young and not particularly experienced. And um, I know that there's been fathers who I know who have took their children. And, you know, you've got to think, right, if if the child is ill or you know something happens well that adult can get that child back but what happens if something happens to the adult what does the ch- the child is there on his own in the water could be in the sea you know there's got you know what do, do they know what to do or how is they you know, it's, it is a tough one and you it, it could be just having somebody on the shore expecting them back you know, so that there's somebody there looking out for them at the shore to say, right, okay, they're not back yet. So, um, yeah. you know, that'd be good. So uh, I think it's a good point. I mean, I'm already looking at rescue diver courses for both of us, actually. I think we'll we'll do it together. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, keeping those skills really well honed as well. I think it's very easy once you've learned to dive and you've got your qualifications, you can just go off and be a diver. But actually you know how good are your skills if something does go wrong you know how can quickly can you react and think in a stressful environment and do the right thing so yeah, um, yeah. yeah it's, cool. it's all good stuff yeah it's all good stuff really yeah. yeah and it's just you know I want him to have a lot of fun I want us to have a lot of fun in the water but there also is you know there is a serious safe. With this and yeah be safe at the end of the day yeah. yeah yeah always safe and always learning that's it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so David, we ask our guests uh, always three questions. Uh, so Miranda has been through this. So one of our questions to all our guests is, if, if you could take three people diving, they don't need to be divers, but just so that you can get them underwater and they can experience that underwater world, what three people, who would you take and why? Ian and Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. I like that. Um, God, oh, three people. Um, God, I don't know. Somebody you, um, I, I don't know. Maybe it might be nice to take some David Attenborough diving. I think that would be quite nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, people like that. Yeah, I think people who can make an influence with regards to the issues that we, we're involved in. You mm. know, obviously they have a bigger. Uh, amount of people who listen to what they have to say um so i would think people like that would be great you know to dive with those sort of people who who could raise the profile of these issues yeah and saying you know there are people who are not necessarily the solution but they're trying to make a difference okay 
So okay. you and David Attenborough, whenever you can sort that out. That's <laughs> yeah, no, we'd love to. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, and Miranda as well, as, of course. I can't even um, remember who I said. Do you remember you said one? Libby Lee what was one of your oh, friends. Oh, Libby, yeah, yeah. Sylvia Earle. Yeah. And David Attenborough. Oh, everybody <laughs> wants David Attenborough. They, they do. Know. He's like the coolest guy in the universe ever, full stop. Yeah. He's very much in demand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. And um, if you if you could put something on a um, David, if you could put a image, a video, um, a statement, whatever you like, on a billboard, and that, uh, the whole world will see it. What would you put on it, and why? Neptune pointing a trident, saying, "Our oceans need you." Brilliant. Yeah, very, yeah, and everybody knows who Neptune is, so that was perfect. Yeah. It's a bit like Kitchener. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Still, Lord Kitchener. Yeah, no, really, really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one of our final questions is what have you taken from your diving journey? Is there any sort of nugget that you would wish to? Tell everybody else um, that they're going to benefit from something that you've taken from your diving journey, like a nugget of life. Well, I, I just think it's such an amazing experience. You know, even even if you're on, you know, on your own, like on a night dive or something like that, and just turn the lights, turn your torch off, and just lay on the sand, and it's just so quiet and tranquil until your buddy comes along, and puts their torch on. <laughs> <laughs> and shine it in your eyes yeah, exactly and then yeah. you're blinded again no um, there's loads of things now I, I think it's personal experiences that always um stay with me you know and some of them have been as a, a result if you like of being on uh, dives with narc for instance like we did a dive uh, on the south of pembrokeshire and we were being circled by about a hundred trigger fish. Oh wow! Oh. And in amongst this, then was um, an almaco jack, which um, I, I I reported this then to um, a friend of mine who's with the Scoma Marine, well, the Scoma MNR dive team, and then they sent that off then to the uh, to Douglas Hudson in the. Um, aquarium museum or whatever in plymouth national aquarium and he identified it then as an almaco jack and it was the second recorded sighting in i've not the- heard of that no yeah well the first one was a week before lundy but what i'd ever say is this isn't it you know is there's great ex- experiences to be you know to be witnessed like natural things and i think with diving, we're, we're very privileged to be able to experience the things that we see. Very much so in in the same way you look at people who go bird watching. I mean, that's another sort of interest with a lot of dedication, where people are getting up at silly o'clock to get up to a certain place to see a bird do a particular thing. You know, <laughs> we're we're all we're all at it, and we you know we're all appreciated and all the natural world around us i think it's very important and for us to be out there and to appreciate it we can also take on board then the fragility of it all yeah and then hopefully you know be able to go away and maybe ask questions and and maybe try and do something to try and make a difference somehow you know yeah you know at the end the day you know like we're setting up like a group like narc like 18 years ago i mean you know i'm not anything special and this is the sort of thing anybody anywhere could do you know i'm just i'm just a plumber (laughs) i'm not you know a marine biologist or a scientific background or anything like that i'm just a normal man on the street sort of thing you made a good point. And I think, do you know what, if there's anything to take away from today's episode is look at your own back garden, look at your own, Definitely. what's on your doorstep, you know, contact your dive center, contact, um, you know, your local BZAC, your paddy groups, 
Um, and find if you're not, you know, if you the thing about diving, it's all about, you know, fellowship and friendship and getting out there and you know you're going to get a hold of people who are in your area in your local area and they'll probably be doing very similar things you know so that would be really cool you know uh to make contact with your local dive center and see who's doing stuff who's doing you know there's facebook all those groups where there's yeah. local litter picking groups um you know and make contact and uh look what's going on in, in your own area yeah definitely yeah. And it, it makes the whole, like like I was saying before, like grassroots thing, it makes it all stronger, you yeah. know, like I say, roots. So it's all binding together to make one strong, I don't know, bark or, or stem or whatever you like to call it. Sounds like we need to come to uh, come over there and have a dive with you. Yes. You're more than welcome. That'd be yeah. really cool. Welcome. Yeah. No, it's been great having you on and uh, yeah, really interesting. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, we'll get lots of people, especially in the UK, looking up um, your organisation and uh, yeah, taking a bit more of an interest and hopefully inspire some people to get in the UK waters. Yeah. And, and, and cool. if, if anybody is interested in, in setting up a group like NARC or anything like that in their own areas, um, if they would like any guidance as to how to go about doing something, then, you know, ourselves at NARC would, would be more than glad to help. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Okay, well, we'll put that all in the show notes. But, yeah, it's been lovely having you on. And thank you, yeah, Miranda and David. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you very much thank for coming you. on, both Thanks of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> good seeing you again, Miranda. Have a good weekend. <laughs> yeah, have a lovely weekend. Have a lovely weekend. Bye. Cheers, David. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Alrighty. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, that was a really good conversation with Miranda and Dave. And thanks to them both for coming on. Yeah. And take a look at um, Neptune Army of Rubbish Cleaners Narc. website. No. Yeah, um, you know, it's good stuff. And I think if you take anything away from that, like we said right from the outset, you know, Let's focus on what's on our doorstep. Let's focus on. Somebody famous actually said something about this, and I think I don't know where that was. Um, oh, I can't remember who the who, who said it now, but somebody did say something about focusing on your uh, back garden, on your doorstep, yeah. and every a little bit helps. Anything that you can do within your little area of the world is going to make a difference. Even a five minute beach clean. Mm. You know, every time you go to the beach and you know, and a lot of people are doing that at the moment, it's a good time to pick, you know, to spend five, ten minutes. So it's almost like giving something back, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Is that you're going around picking up stuff which shouldn't have been there in the first place. I get it. But, you know, we can pick it up. Every little helps. Yeah. And if you can do something with it and that can be recycled, that's, that's even a bigger bonus. Yeah. Yeah. So... Check out um, the website. And Dave did say that if anybody uh, wants to make contact with him, to drop him a line. Yeah, do that. And he'll give you some tips and a bit of advice and mm. uh, how you can start your own NARC, if you like. Yeah. But your own, basically your own little group and Facebook group of uh, getting some fellow cleaners together. Yeah, but thank you. It'd be nice to get down there, actually, and... Uh, have a dive with them, actually. Yeah, well, he did say, you did say we're one of his yeah. um, people and to dive I'll tell you with. one thing that came, came across in the, the chat is how informative he knows, you know, about the wildlife mm. and stuff. You know, yeah. he, he really does know stuff. Yeah, yeah. He and, years uh, of diving, yeah. in, you know, in that area. And brilliant. Miranda's a great compliment to him as well because, um, yeah. yeah, with all her UK diving and passion for UK diving as well. Yeah, so, so that's, you know, re really good to hear talking about uk diving mm -hmm. so we've got a bit of an announcement um you know on the big scuba we've been going a couple of years we like to kind of evolve don't we and yeah, sort of, evolve and grow uh, evolve and grow um and we're always uh open-minded about uh what way we want to take the podcast we've always said we're going to have no limits exactly with the podcast um you know and you're probably aware by now that we love to build relationships with not just fellow divers, but also with companies in the industry as well. Yeah, so that's... It's about <clears throat> the community, yeah, after it's, all. 
It's about diving, yes, but anything to do with marine conservation. So hence earlier we mentioned waterhole and we're, you know, tying up with recycled plastic yeah. made from nets. Yeah, so yeah. it's all interlinked. It certainly is. Um, so we uh, have been talking to somebody who we met uh, mm -hmm. diving yep. uh, at End, Lundy. Yeah, end of May. And he's a skipper. <laughs> His name's Ben. Ben yeah. Bengi. And uh, he, so... Uh, on a reasonably, we're going to keep it fluid for the time being, but you know, because Ben is really, really busy. Um, but we're going to hopefully, on a regular basis, we'll be dialing in with um, Ben to catch up on life as being a skipper. So, Ben Bingy is, is 27. Yeah, he's a skipper. Yeah, he's got a amazing. child, mm -hmm. and he is going to be well, he's a skipper, he's a coxswain. He's the youngest coxswain. He's one of the youngest in the UK coxswain on the RNLI uh, lifeboat. He so, is. Yeah, um, and that he's based in Ilfracombe, which yeah. is in North West Devon. Yeah, his dad uh, runs a dive boat um, called the Obsession 2. Mm -hmm. um, and he, Ben has basically followed in his footsteps and has been in... Uh, messing around with boats since he was a toddler. Basically. He called himself a harbour rat. Yeah. And uh, gr uh, great character, and uh, we're really pleased uh, yeah. um, to be able to go to Ben on a regular basis and find out what's been happening, what's life like as a dive captain, <laughs> and he'll be able to, you know, we see one side of being a dive, you know, divers on on a dive boat, and he'll be able to give us the other. Yes. He doesn't just do um, dive boats, so he'll take marine biologists to the island. He takes deliveries to the island. Yeah, he's well. He is basically a charter boat. So if people yeah. want to use his boat for, I mean, it's not just diving. He does free dive, uh, wild swimming, doesn't he? Snorkeling yeah. with the seals. So basically, he will take you over to Lundy. He's got an amazing boat called the Barbara B. Yeah, uh, it's just had two new props put on it, so it goes really fast now. Yeah, can and you can look him up as Hi Ho Charters. Charters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so he's pretty active on social media and he's got a crew. Uh, we met Sammy, yeah. who is uh, one of his regular crew. So he's only 20-something. Yeah, and I think 20s. some of his RNLI uh, friends yeah. help out occasionally yeah. as well. Yeah, so it's great that it's all a team effort. Bit of a family um, organisation. Really. Mm. Yeah, Fair. and you know, there's a number of crew that take on the skippering and the sort of but he goes out all times so whether it's winter or not you know he'll go out and you've got to remember as well is that you know where Ilfracombe is, is you know in the Bristol Channel it is regarded as having some of the biggest uh, tidal reaches, tidal reaches isn't it? yeah mm. and it's a real rough can be a real rough piece yeah. of water there when we're saying tidal um we're talking like 12 13 meters yeah. difference which difference. is just staggering it's huge just, amount of water yeah. difference yeah and i think when we were in ilford cream we couldn't get over how much the tide had gone up and down in our the, tides here <laughs> just a few yeah, yeah a couple yeah. of meters Tops, difference yeah but there's massive you know real difference yeah. and you can see that when you're when you're out there um you know, in the actual rock formations, mm. in, you know, in the countryside on, on the on the shoreline. On the shoreline, yeah. yeah. And it's great that Ben obviously is a youngster, but he kind of lives and breathes Lundy, being out on his boat, and he's sort of got to know the history. He's not the big, biggest of divers. He hasn't dived for a while, but he no. knows the dive sites. Yeah. Um, but you know, he's in there the whole time. He's fishing. Uh, the boat sometimes gets used for his fishing. He catches whelks. whelks. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be an all-round good ex good fun having him on. And here, and, you know, for a lot of us, we, this is a side of life that we don't see a lot unless we actually do go on a dive boat. Or for some of us who maybe just go, either go abroad or we won't don't see this side. No. So Ben will be bringing a different part to it. yeah and it's quite nice because obviously we're a uk based podcast although we are out there yeah. in the big wide world so next episode we'll, we're going to be talking to ben uh and he'll be talking about his life and how he got into doing what he does um and you know he has he has been a diver he has seen seen what's like under there yeah. um but he says you know at the minute he's just so busy with work and one thing and another and fishing that at the minute 
divers had to take a step back for the time being. Yeah, but him. he's you know looking after us, all us divers on the boat. Yeah, and getting shouts where they are on their line and everything else. So look out for that. Uh, it's going to be fun. We're excited. Mm, and, yeah, it's uh, great. Can't to... wait to start sharing that with you. Yeah. And yeah, if you obviously give Ben a listen, and uh, if you're interested in uh, going out on a dive to Lundy, he's your man. He'll be your man. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So uh, we'll be putting lots of links in and things like that when we speak to him. And uh, yeah. but for you know, uh, look forward to it. it. Should be fun. Yep. So that'll he's be a the fun, next. He's a fun character. So <laughs> uh, that'll be good. Yeah. So that'll be the next episode. Um, yeah, we've got a few other episodes in the pipeline, which yeah. we'll tell you about next time. Certainly will. But for right now. This is the Big Scoop Podcast, and thank you for downloading. Yeah, thanks for downloading. Now that does wrap up today's episode of the Big Scoop Podcast. But if you want to hear more from the podcast, make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button, depending on what platform you are listening on. That way, you will never miss an episode from us. But if you are listening on Apple Podcasts and did enjoy what you heard today, we would really appreciate it if you head to the show page to leave a five-star rating and review. It really does help us. If you do, please take a screenshot of that review and send it to us on Instagram and we'll give you a shout out to say a big thank you. If you have any questions for us or anything that has been mentioned in today's episode, be sure to reach out to us on any of our social media platforms or send us an email. The links are in the show notes. We will get back to you no matter what. If you have made it to this point in the episode, we both want to say a big, big thank you for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode.